So welcome everybody to today's uh, edition, to today's interview, Sezi Talks. Sezi Talks part of the WEEP program, uh, which we are currently running with the support of the European Parliament. It's designed to bring, how could I say, international European actors, key, key um, stakeholders and key players and their activities close to our members and their affiliates. And today I have the particular pleasure to welcome uh, Vic van Vuren. Vic is ILO doc director of the enterprise department. And he also chairs PAGE, the partnership between UN agencies for green economy. And finally, just a little hint also, um, the unit on green jobs is also part of Vic's department. Vic, welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, can you say uh, briefly explain a little bit the mandate of the Enterprise Department of the International Labour Organization and how do you promote decent work? I think, you know, when one engages in the whole world of the decent work agenda, enterprises obviously play a very key role because they employ workers and that's where the relationship, the employment relationship starts. And so we've got the different facets of the Enterprise Department that um, guide the relationship between enterprises and the workers. And we promote um, sustainable uh, enterprises. That's really what we're about. And when we talk about sustainable enterprises, we want to see that they are in line with the decent work agenda. So at the very top, we deal with the multinational enterprises. And that is where we've spent some time over the years. 40 years ago, we started with the um, tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy, which is known as the M&E declaration. And so that particular unit in the enterprise department, which is one of five units, um, focuses on the promotion of this M&E declaration to all these big players. But we then move down the ladder and we get to the uh, medium, the small enterprises, because that is where most of the jobs are being created in the future. And so we focus then on the SMEs, where we look at the creation of SMEs and also looking at um, helping the existing SMEs become more productive and more aligned with the decent work agenda. Because it's at that level that you find that workers are less organized and represented. And so that becomes a critical interface for us as to how we can promote decent work amongst small and medium enterprises, right down to the micro enterprise. Then we move a little bit out of the private sector arena and we talk about the social economy, which is becoming a big player in the economy at the moment. And we look at the social and solidarity economy. And over the years, we've had a department or it's a unit that has been 100 years old now is the cooperative unit. And there we look at the role of cooperatives and also the other social enterprises. And that is growing more and more in importance as we move towards supporting the attainment of the sustainable development goals. The next unit will be the, the green jobs unit. And there we will touch on a little bit later, but we, we re recognize that the future employment area lies in the creation of green jobs. And to determine what is a green job, how does one move from closing a coal mine down to something more effective? What happens to the workers? And that's where we talk about the very well-known just transition guidelines of the ILO, uh, which, which is available across the world. And in COP26, which I've just returned from, in, uh, in Glasgow, these just transition guidelines were really sought after by most parties in their discussions. And then the last part is, is social finance. How do we look at innovative finance? How do we look at access to finance for uh, enterprises? What do we look at impact investment? It shouldn't just be profit driven. We're starting to look at these other indicators of environmental challenges and the social challenges. How do we ensure decent work? So when you put these five different units together, which are integrated in their activities, you find that is the mandate of the enterprise department. You you mentioned especially the, the how could I say the the enterprise, the employers as being of course uh, uh, one of the key actors in all in all the the design I would say of socially fair uh, of socially fair environment working environment. Um, if we speak of responsible business conduct or the CSRs, the corporate social responsibility, how how important is let's say 
self-binding uh, um, or, or the, let's say the voluntary compliance of companies of employers with um, uh, let's say uh, labor law and ethical standards i think we, we get it you get different kind of levels so we so you find those companies that are the real role models that take the m e declaration the guiding un guiding principles and the oecd guidelines and you find they they follow them very closely and those are the champions out there that we like to support because they follow not only content but process. You must remember that process through collective bargaining, through social dialogue, is equally important in today's world to ensure that workers get a fair hearing and, and a decent uh, uh, contract and agenda. And so what we've got is these first uh, level of companies. But unfortunately, there are too many companies that fly below the radar screen across the globe. Now, when you start moving into developing economies, it's far more uh, difficult to monitor the compliance at international standard level of these enterprises and that's where our work is really has to be focused but it's great because we work with the organized workers we like uh, the, the trade unions and we work with the organized employers and and through that we try and drill down into the levels where we find there's non-compliance now the value chains becomes a very important part of this debate because if you've got these good companies that are playing at the multinational level, and there are some that aren't, but there are many that do. Um, if you can use them to be the leverage down the value chain, it becomes much easier to implement labor conditions in areas where the governance is, is lacking. I'll give you an example. If you're going down to um, Central Africa, the mining of cobalt in, in, in DRC, you find that the governance there is very difficult to implement from a government point of view because their systems are not so well implemented then you rely on these companies down the value chain to ensure that through their contracting processes, they leverage and put into place decent working conditions and, and the like. So that becomes extremely important. Um, you have been mentioning the, the international supply chains and also you're certainly aware of the German government's, uh, how could I say, initiative and the Lieferkettengesetz. Um, what is, well, how do you see the role of the EU in, in, in promoting, how could I say, fair uh, international value supply chains. Um, DJ Reinders, I think the, the EU Commissioner for Justice, I think it was last year, he launched a cons consultation on sustainable social governance. How, 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 how do you see the leverage? You just spoke about leverage here in order to, to worldwide to create some kind of fair playing uh, level or, or let's say a fair playing field. I think the first is that you need to look at best practice and that's where Europe comes into the play. I mean, no, no area has got its, uh, every area has got its challenges, but what I find is that in Europe, you've got good examples of best practice. So the first thing is to create this example to the world out there, particularly the developing economy of how things can be done in a fair and just manner. But at the same time, the governments in Europe and, and the other investing countries through their investment patterns, can certainly put some conditions on there that ensure the compliance of, of a decent work agenda. And that's where the, when we talk about impact investing, but not only that, they can, through the companies that operate out of Europe, they can ensure that these guidelines and these standards are met through the value chain and the, and the subcontracting. So the, the leverage will go to the companies themselves. It will also go to governments. And it's then the role of the trade unions and the employer associations to also play their role in guiding and helping uh, implement. So I think the leverage has got to come from different levels. It's from governments, it's from investors, it's from organized employers and organized workers. Vic, you just came back from uh, Glasgow last week. How, how far is, uh, how could I say, socially fair green transition fundamental for its success? My, my concern is the following. I think when I came from Glasgow, I, I have no doubt that there's a lot of research that's been done as to what we need to do to become uh, more environmentally friendly. But it's no doubt that if we move along that tra trajectory, we're going to find a loss of jobs. It's inevitable that certain industries are going to have to close down their way of working. But on the other hand, we, we find that there's many opportunities. My concern is that there hasn't been enough work done and understanding of where these opportunities are. So we're very quick to move to close down a coal mine. But then you've got a community and, a, and, and workers who then left on the side destitute what happens to them? It's all very well to say, but they, we can create 19 million jobs by the year 2030 of a net gain. But where are those jobs and what are they? 
and the investment patterns need to move up into investing to these new jobs. The reskilling needs to take place. There's a whole pattern of events and that's where the just transition guidelines become crucial. And so I understand from COP that we know what to do. It's the doing of that that I'm concerned that, that we're not up to speed yet. Maybe a last question, um, also because you have a background, of course, um, both from the public sector, but also from the private sector as a, in different executive positions. We are always a little bit worried also from, from our perspectives, especially in sectors which you mentioned, uh, uh, which, which will be hit clearly, for instance, the automotive industries. Um, what makes, what would make you so confident that when you have a look at the European Union, that we can manage these green transitions and remain competitive in the future? Yeah, that's one of the interesting components that we've had in the governing body of the ILO is talking about productivity. Productivity levels are stagnated and unless we keep viable enterprises going, we're not going to keep up the game. And so we're going to, we've launched a, a product called uh, the uh, Productivity Ecosystem where we're looking at the macro policy, the, enter, the, the sectoral level and the enterprises. And it's been a tricky debate for, for, for us to get through because on the one hand, you've got the workers who are concerned about, yes, you're making lots more profits, but there's not a, a very sh a sharing of the gains. On the other side, the employer is saying, look, unless we become more productive, our businesses are not going to succeed. So for us, we've got this productivity drive, but we need to keep the players on board to make sure that this is a win-win for everybody. Otherwise, it's going to be a win for the one and a loss for the other. So this whole component, which is well embedded in the European models of productivity enhancement, but we need to follow from the ILO perspective, how we can make this a fair gain for the future. And that is an area we're going to focus on. Nick, thanks a lot. Wish you all the best of success. Thank you. And hope to see, to meet you soon in person. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>